Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy RN is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy RN. Welcome to Dr. Nancy RN, Healthy World, Healthy Nation, Healthy You. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse, and this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And today our topic is genetics and genetic testing, a word that I'm sure you've heard, but few of us really understand the ins and outs of genetics. But we have guests today that are really going to educate us about this. Our title of our show today is Genetic Testing, what it means to you and your health, which by the way, is a lot. There's a lot happening in this world of genetics. There's a lot happening now and there'll be a lot more in the future. And we'll learn today about how advancements in technology is really helping to fuel this, this momentum to really use this more in healthcare. So let me introduce our two spectacular and sparkling guests today. We have Dr. Marion Rafe, who is a senior research investigator at the Penn Center for the Integration of Genetic Healthcare Technologies. And her colleague I'd like to introduce is Serbi Mucindani, who is a senior genetic counselor. She is working together with Marion on a project. This project is uh, spanning both the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Their research project, which they will be telling us about today, is focused on the impact of genetic test results for families and for healthcare providers as they are working with children. So it's a very, very interesting topic and I wanna thank our two guests for being with us. And let me give you a little bit of background on them because they certainly are two amazing people in terms of how they brought their independent skills together to really solve problems. So let me start with Marion Rafe. Marion has a background in public health medical anthropology, which is the study of culture and health and social work. So she also has a degree from uh, Columbia University in socio-medical sciences, which is the intersection of health, illness, and society. Now, she'll tell us about that because these are very high-level areas of interest, but she's really brought it to bear on that feet-on-the-ground work that she is doing in genetics. And then her colleague, um, Serbi. Serbi has, uh, she's certified as a genetic counselor. So for instance, if you ever come in contact with um, genetics in your life or someone that you know, you would be lucky to have Serbi as your genetic counselor because she is so well prepared. She has two master's degrees. She first has a master's degree in molecular and human genetics and has a second one in genetic counseling. So you can see that these two women are very well prepared for our topic today. And even though this is going to be part of a series on how we're going to talk about genetics and autism, we're starting this out by really just talking about genetics, sort of the genetics 101 approach, so that you will have a baseline of information to understand how genetics is really utilized in any disorder. So I think that's a rather long introduction and we want to get to our guests, but uh, I'd like to hear from both of you about how you even got involved in your fields, and, and that would be a segue to you know, what you're doing now. So Marion, let's start with you. That whole idea of medical uh, sociology, uh, it's, it's just fascinating. Tell us about it. Well, um, I studied, uh, first I studied social work. I have a master's in social work, and I was um, working as a social worker in a hospital uh, in London. And I was becoming aware that many of the um, problems I was seeing, you know, people were ill in hospital and they had a lot of social problems. So mm -hmm. I became interested in this intersection of uh, social problems with health problems. And I decided I wanted to do some further study. And um, I was very excited to discover that they have a program at Columbia University called Sociomedical Sciences, which is exactly about that. And I had the opportunity to um, do a PhD there and specialized in medical anthropology and public health. So it was exactly that, looking at um, you know, how social problems and health problems really um, come together and how people um, 
interpret their um, their problems and their their health uh, in different ways depending on the culture right. that they're in and their beliefs and have different practices. So mm, that's fascinating, and mm -hmm. I think even becoming more applicable to all the changes that are going on in healthcare, all those areas where we do have to intersect and really understand how health, illness, and society come together, I think is more important than ever. Would you agree? I absolutely, yes. And especially in a very diverse population where people come from different uh, places and they may have different ideas mm -hmm. about um, their own health and what, um, what they do, different health practices. Uh, so I've worked in different, um, with different immigrant groups. Um, some uh, people who come from Latin America, for example. Um, I've looked at their use of herbal medicine. And um, it's been very interesting and important for doctors to also understand that people are using these kinds right. of medical right. practices themselves and trying to integrate that into their whole health picture. Right. Well, I think it's yeah. really wonderful to hear about that because with all the <coughs> new people that are enrolling with healthcare reform, and uh, having the insurance coverage now, we're going to be seeing more of these diverse populations from, from every background imaginable. So I think the more that uh, the public and, and those of you who are healthcare providers that may be watching this show, I think someone with uh, Marion's background is really going to become extremely relevant. So, so thank you for doing what you're doing. And uh, Serby, tell us about you. How did you get involved with um, genetics, genetic counseling? What really piqued your interest? Um, I think people who go in genetics um, have the personality where they really want to understand different things, to put pieces of puzzle together and look at the puzzle. So I think I had a little bit of that personality, all right. Um, but when I was doing my undergrad uh, majoring in biology, I was trying to figure out what meaningful career I would want to pursue in life. Um, and I came across the word genetic counseling. I was like, that sounds really interesting. And I started researching more about it. Um, um, and as I did, it just spoke so much to me, um, not just because it was interesting and you know I was going to be able to do more than just look at my books and experiments, um, but because of my family history, because of my own personal experience, um, my mother and father both um, had some disabilities and um, before they conceived uh, myself and my brother, um, the question is that going to happen to their family again, um, are the, their condition going to be in their children again? and they were trying to find those answers and this is if many years ago and there wasn't that much information available to them and they were very anxious and I know that at that time getting that information while well, this condition is not genetic or this is genetic was very very reassuring to them um, so knowing that and the rest of the family over um, my lifetime has asked those questions again and again so I knew that being able to do this and giving the information back to the families was just so important and I figured I could do that because right. I enjoyed genetics. So that was that's how it all started. Then I did masters in molecular and human genetics just to understand genetics really well. Um, and then I moved to United States to do a master's degree in genetic counseling. Um, and I have been practicing as a genetic counselor for um, five years now. Um, and I have been interpreting genetic test results um, for patients with um, various kinds of conditions and I think I've done about 10,000 of those at this point. That's a lot. So you have a lot of experience for a, a, a young person. That's fantastic. That's great. It's definitely an exciting time, an exciting field. That's great. I think that's probably part of why we uh, entitled our show. It, it's genetics as it applies to your health or the health of someone you know, but it is, as we've heard from Serbi, it's also for your family. Some people really pursue this because they want to know if there are certain biological markers that can be uh, isolated through these genetic tests that will give information so that people can do some planning around their health issues uh, and really understand what might be forecasted and coming down the road. Now, I think it goes beyond the, uh, the scope of this particular discussion, but I think that if we look down the road in the future of genetics, we're gonna have a lot more information about our ancestors as well as uh, ourselves as a, as a whole species and, and where we're going uh, as we evolve. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the work that you're doing. So the fact that the two of you came together, tell us that story because I think it's relevant to the studies that you're involved in right now. Yeah, well, there was, um, 
a center at the University of Pennsylvania uh, called the Center for um, Integration of Genetic Healthcare Technologies. And um, that came about um, around um, probably six years ago. And I was um, very interested in doing that. I had done a little bit of work in um, looking at the public knowledge about genetics. And um, so I, I got involved with that center. And then uh, it was a very new test that had recently been developed uh, called chromosomal microarray uh, analysis. That's a big word. Yeah. Can you tell us what that <laughs> means in, in regular language? <laughs> Say that again, chromosomal. Chromosomal microarray analysis. OK. And um, it's, a, it's a test that looks at all of the DNA. Um, and it was new in that sense that the technology had developed to that extent that it was possible to look at somebody's complete DNA picture. So that's what this test was doing, and to look at it in sufficient detail to understand if there was a genetic variation mm -hmm. um, that might influence um, somebody's health. I see. Um, so that had come about, and the person who was um, doing this was at uh, the Cent Children's Hospital of Philadelphia at CHOP. And uh, she was just very interested to know, you know, how these new kinds of test results were affecting people, especially because um, one of the big issues, especially at the beginning, was that there was a lot of uncertainty in these types of test results. There were, there were many people who, because it's so new, were receiving results that uh, were just considered what they would consider a variant of uncertain significance, and they would not know what this meant. The mm -hmm. providers didn't know what it meant. The families didn't know what it meant. The lab didn't know what it meant. They didn't know if this was something that was just a normal variation, mm -hmm. which occurs in all of us, or if this was something that could be affecting their health right. in a, that way. So let me, let me just ask a couple uh, questions <coughs> just so I understand and clarify. What era was this when, when the testing really started to get out of the gate? Um, well, I started working on it in 2008. 2008. That, that's not that long ago. Just, yeah, it had been done in research uh, mm -hmm. for a couple of years before that, but then it went into clinics and people were using it on um, not in a research setting, but okay. in a clinical setting. But even in, in that in that period of time, 2008, when they yeah. were conducting these tests, the the results were, as you're saying, uncertain. Yeah. So they were trying to get an idea of what was going on, but it was really hard to be very prescriptive at that point. Well, some results were uncertain. They were getting also definitive results. Okay. So I would say it was probably about 10% definitive results, 10% uncertain results, and then the other 80% were just normal. Right. Uh, so it, they were using it really because they wanted to get the definitive results. So somebody's been looking for an answer. What's wrong with my child? If someone had been looking for years, and they had had other genetic tests before that that right. were available at that time, but they hadn't come up with an answer yet. Right. So this was now you can look at the gene in more detail. So people were coming now and saying, well, can we see now? Is this is a new genetic test. So and some of them, in 10% mm -hmm. of cases, 10% of the children that were tested, they said, oh, yes, we know now what's wrong with your child. And this was something new. So it was very helpful right. for those. Unfortunately, in another 10%, they said, well, we did find something, but we don't really know what this means for you and right. for, your, for your child. Right. But I think it's a good so, example yeah. of how um, there are a couple, th I think, lessons learned in that, in that discussion. One is that something's better than nothing if you don't really have uh, some baseline information about your condition really searching for that, that understanding is a driver, and, and certainly the team wants to help you with that. It also it tells us about technology. It's always on a curve. It's always improving. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2008 <laughs> wasn't that long ago, and I'm sure there have been improvements since then. Yeah, mm -hmm. tremendous. You want, you want to tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Um, sure. I think this is like you know one of um, mm -hmm. our um, interests to talk about the history and how genetic testing has evolved over the years. Um, it was in 1950s uh, when 
the chromosome numbers were discovered that we, um, chromosomes by the way, are just the material that contains our genetic information or genetic blueprint. Um, but the correct number, how many chromosomes every human uh, contains, it was, it was in 50s that we had identified. And so from there to now, the technology has just, you know, um, evolved and evolved. So what we could do then to now um, is just so different. Um, and 2008, as we were saying, was the first time that Children's Hospital of Philadelphia brought this test on to do clinically. Um, and in 2014, we will be launching another new test called whole exome sequencing, which is just even higher resolution than what we could do before. So it is changing. It's just emerging. We could look at the chromosomes under the microscope and could tell you many years ago um, what is the correct number and if you have those or not. And we could diagnose things like Down syndrome, which a lot of us know uh, is having an extra chromosome number 21. So instead of having two, you have three of those. And we could do that easily many years ago versus what we can do. It's just amazing. It's just tremendous. Right. And the complexity has just increased. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons that I um, started to work um, as a genetic counselor in the same lab at the Children's Hospital of right. Philadelphia. Right. Well, it sounds like the two of you are doing great mm -hmm. work together. But as you can hear, they're using some large terms and big words. So <laughs> I've asked Serby to help us understand. So she's going to walk us through a couple visuals so that for those of you that do not know what DNA is, or you've never heard of the word chromosome, she's gonna give you a little walkthrough of that. So, Serby, you're on. Okay, um, so you're going to see two images. So the first image is um, the one that has um, genetic information, it's titled as genetic information. You have four panels in this image, and the first one, um, I'm not an artist, by the way, but I did make this image up trying to explain <laughs> what genetic information means. Um, so the first image really is just of an individual. So you can see that, you know, our bodies are made up of the next image of cells. That's really the unit of life. Um, every single cell contains our genetic blueprint, the information that tells us how we look, our hair color, our eye color, height, and how we function really. Um, and this genetic information is made up of what's called the DNA. Um, if I was to just expand on it, it's called deoxyribonucleotide acid. Um, but DNA for now is um, good enough. This DNA is packaged in what's called chromosomes. Um, so now, which, uh, just so we follow, which picture are we looking at now, Serby? So we are looking at um, the third picture, so the second magnifying glass. So we are just increasing the resolution. We are starting with one um, individual. We are looking, then the second image is peeping into one of the cells. Okay. And then we are, the next magnifying glass shows um, um, a pair of chromosomes. So DNA is packaged in chromosomes, which is where this genetic information resides. And the next picture just shows um, the resolution of it. So the chromosomes, as I said, are made up of DNA. Every single cell in our body contains 46 strings of DNA or 23 pairs of uh, this DNA that is packaged in chromosome. Now one set of this 23 chromosomes comes from dad, one set comes from mom. So we have two sets of these. These chromosomes are just labeled as chromosome 1 to 22 and the last pair is um, the sex chromosome pair. S females have two X chromosomes and males have um, one X and a Y chromosome and that's really is um, you know, the basic of uh, sexual determination in humans, the X and the Y chromosomes. Now, these structures house what are called genes, and we use this word all the time, genes. This is really the recipe or the instructions that tells us our bodies what to do and how to function. Um, and we have got about 20 to 25 thousands of these genes um, in these chromosomes. And one of the analogies that people give um, of how this whole system works, really, um, my favorite analogy is um, of um, a recipe. So chromosomes um, are like 
a volume uh, of 23 different books um, that contain recipes. Um, <laughs> and every single uh, book contains some kind of recipes, and every single recipe is like a gene that's got the information in it. And um, then it's really that simple. Gene tells you, gives you the instruction, and that's how the body functions. Um, but this also leads us to understand if there is a page of the recipe missing, the recipe is going to be incomplete. Or if you have a spelling mistake in one of the words in the recipe, you're not really going to know how to make meaning out of what you know the recipe is asking you to do. Um, and that's how really um, the genetic alterations are basically. Right. That is a fabulous explanation. I think that is so understandable because what we're talking about is something we can't see. I mean, we can't see our cells, we can't see our genes, we can't see our DNA and our chromosomes, which I think, so we did a good job of drawing that out for us so we could really sort of understand the building blocks of this. But there are all those subtle differences that, as she said, really makes up who we are. But when we have problems, something is really miscalculated in some of these things. As she said, the recipe just doesn't uh, have every little detail in it. That's when you run into problems. And what you're telling us is that this genetic testing is really to map exactly where in this very enormous uh, body of cells that we have, where is it? So that they can really isolate what that chromosome, what that thread-like uh, item where it has issues and problems and therefore becomes the basis for then the, the next step, which would be the intervention, the treatment, if, if possible. I mean, not everything has an intervention and treatment, but really just sort of understanding where the sort of oops is in those recipes is the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that is very helpful. I think that that really helps us to understand um, genetics 101 so that we understand what the relevance is to our conversations for any disorder. Um, and why genetic counseling, which again would be a whole other discussion, how genetic counseling helps people to even understand and interpret their own results. I'm sure that's where it begins because it is not something that the average person is really gonna understand. And you can't necessarily just read a manual on this or read a book. I mean, it does need professional um, intervention and explanation. but. I think that is a great way, you know, to really help us. So since the two of you are working together, let's, let's use your study as, as an application for this. Um, tell us how you're applying that knowledge and experience, your interest, Marion, with uh, where this all comes together for people. Tell us about the project you're working on. Okay, so the project um, started, as we said, in 2008 and started with looking at some of the first families to undergo this type of testing. And um, we were interested in finding out the perspective of the parents involved and of the family members and of the children if they were able to give it, if they were old enough to, to talk with us. Um, so it involved, first of all, going into the clinics and observing. That's something that anthropologists do. It's called participant observation and just watching what happens and then talking to people about mm -hmm. it. So then I would you know, sit and watch the genetic counselors talking with the families and watch the geneticists talking with the families and then talk to the families about that experience. Mm -hmm. And then I would go back and talk to, with them again after they get their test results and find out what their understanding is of that test result. Can I ask you, was this for any particular disorder or was it for any kind of genetic problem? At the beginning, it was for any kind of genetic problem, but mm -hmm. with this particular test okay. involved. We were focusing on the test okay. um, at the beginning. And then we advanced to uh, clinical guidelines. And the clinical guidelines came out in 2010, and they recommended um, this type of testing, chromosomal microarray testing, for many, many different types of children, but one of the children, um, the types of children that it was recommended for were children with autism spectrum disorders. Oh. And so it became yes. um, a very relevant and important issue to, to look at autism in this context. It, because of the prevalence of autism being what it is, one in 68 children now in the United States, and increasing, um, it's something that's likely to affect many people. So many families are 
likely to undergo this type of testing uh, in the near future. Right. So it becomes an important issue to investigate further to see right. how do families make meaning of these results and how do they cope with some of the uncertainties involved in them. That, that is fascinating. So mm -hmm. just, just to really sort of walk through this whole process, in a couple of years, a test was used looking for many different p potential problems. Uh, and part of Marion's uh, work was to observe and talk with families directly and, and with individuals. But then they were able to really isolate, meaning focus on the one disorder that this particular test was most able to pick up. Would that be a fair interpretation? Or the one that they decided they'd like to focus on? I think, yeah, this test is used for many different types of conditions to find an answer when children are, you know, have, they, they can have many different types of, sy of symptoms. But I became interested in autism largely because of my interest in public health and feeling that, oh, it's, um, it's going to be, there are going to be a lot of children with autism who are now right. going to be having this test. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Serby, you wanted to add something to that. What is that? Um, so the test had, um, unprecedented um, resolution and the information that we got back. So before that we had a genetic explanation for 5% individuals or so and this test doubled it up or more to 10 to 15% um, and the guidelines that Marion was talking about. So the guidelines really what they said was now this should be really the first line of testing for individuals with autism spectrum disorder, developmental delay or any birth defects. So this was a huge population um, that it really is right. the first line of testing right. for. Well, I think it's really just an amazing to hear this story of two people that have really lived through this um, evolution of technology and really are able to meet patients, families, uh, and really understand the whole community impact and really want to make a difference, uh, you know, through their work. So give us an update if you could just tell us, like, what is today? What's happening today with this testing? Um, at this point, as I was saying that I have done 10,000 cases, our lab um, has looked at 11,000 or so individuals who have undergone this testing. Um, most of these individuals come through Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They have gone through clinical genetics and other specialty evaluation, and then we get the testing done. Um, our body of knowledge has definitely increased. Um, the gap when we said um, the variant of uncertain significance, so genetic alteration that we couldn't really interpret, the, that those numbers are decreasing, but not 100 percent because the resolution is increasing and we are finding even more information. Right. Um, so we are at an exciting, exciting place um, where we can identify so much information and medically it's just so useful to families right. and to right. um, patients. Right. Um, so that's really where we stand. Our body of knowledge has increased. This is really becoming um, a test that is um, becoming more and more just used by not just by genetic specialists, by other specialists and pediatricians as well. Right. Well, I think that word resolution means it's coming into focus. So you can hear that this whole program has really tried to bring into focus for all of you as our listeners, this whole field of genetics, genetic testing, and obviously this is the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. But what Marion uh, is doing and what Serby is doing is really exciting work for all of us. And you can tell they're excited. These are the type of people that can't wait to get up every day and go to work. Um, and I think that that kind of momentum and enthusiasm is really going to help us as we really understand our health and our illness much more carefully and more in depth. So I really want to thank you both for being with us. I've learned so much from both of you, and I know that there's a lot more that we can learn together. Uh, this whole item of autism is part of a whole series that we're doing. So we're going to have Marion and Serby come back and talk with us more specifically about how genetic testing and autism and your role as a family member, maybe yourself as, as a person with autism or someone that you know will be definitely helped by this program because it is really about you, your understanding and your ability to take those next steps which are so critical to your health and to the health of everyone else. So thank you again to our guests. Thank you all to our listeners. And remember, with health, all things are possible. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. 
or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.